Amen and amen. Well, it's good to be here with you, and it's good to have you here with me. Hallelujah. It's good to be here together. Praise God. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. We get confused sometimes, and we think that what we see and feel down here is the real thing going on. Oh, my. This is just a momentary thing. Hallelujah. I mean, for a moment you appear, and then you're gone. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we're going to jump right into this because I feel like I'm ready to get after it. Uh, but we're going to just continue. This will be the third part in what we're calling the fire triangle. And we want to welcome everybody joining us virtually. So glad that we can uh, have you with us uh, through the uh, technology. And then, of course, this will later be made available on YouTube. Uh, but uh, I want to remind you that a fire needs three elements to burn. A fire needs three elements. It needs heat, fuel, and oxygen. Those are the three elements that a fire needs. Now, if you were to remove those three elements, or if you were to remove one of those elements, that fire will do what? It will begin to diminish and go out. So praise the Lord. We want to understand this is very important during the times that we're living in. But then again, it's been very important for every time uh, that we are living. Let me start you off with one big powerful verse of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5. I mean, this is huge. This is a big verse of Scripture. All four words of it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, hallelujah. <laughs> let's, um, let's do this, 1 Thessalonians 5. Let's just start right there in verse 1 for just a moment to establish something, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Hallelujah. But you, brethren, verse 4, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Let me read that to you again. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day. What are we? Children of the what? The day. We are who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Well, let's just keep reading. This is just so good. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them. We beseech you, brethren, to know them. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And what's the result? Be at peace among yourselves. Now, we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. We're, <laughs> we're getting to it here. Rejoice evermore. Pray <clears throat> without ceasing. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse 19 is where we want to get to. Quench not the spirit. 
quench not the spirit. Or we could say it this way, quench not the fire of God. That tells me that the fire of God can be quenched. It tells me that it's possible. And the language here, in the Greek, it's very strong, it's very emphatic. Quench not the spirit. It means don't extinguish, don't smother, don't suppress, don't douse, don't put off, don't snuff out the spirit or the fire of God. Especially during the seasons and times that we are living in. Because we know the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. In other words, God's not wanting you to wane or burn out or slow down. God's wanting you to burn on, and at the end, when the end comes, He wants you to go out in a blaze of glory. This is His highest and best for me and for you. Not to crawl up and be feeble and weak somewhere and be overcome or to be overtaken by a sickness or a disease or any other kind of a disaster. But to go out in a blaze of glory, a fireball, if you will. Hallelujah. Quench not the spirit. Don't extinguish it. Don't smother it. Don't suppress it. Don't douse it. Don't put it off. Don't snuff it out. I told you that a fire needs three elements. If you take away the heat, if you remove the fuel, what happens to the fire? That's right. Hallelujah. Now that goes right along with what he says here, because Paul talked to the, uh, to the Thessalonians here. And now in 2 Timothy 1, he's going to say something to Timothy, the minister who has apparently been worn down and frustrated. In 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Praise the Lord. Sometimes life or circumstances or even the Lord's business has a way of extinguishing, smothering, suppressing, dousing, snuffing out the fire of God in your life. I know, man. I've been doing this here for 25 years and I know what it feels like. You get so consumed and caught up with the frustrations and the busyness <laughs> that you forgot, oh, wait a minute. I'm supposed to maintain my own fire. What good is any of this if I allow the fire of God in my own life to be snuffed out? What will I have accomplished? So Paul says this to Timothy, who's dealing with some of the same issues. He says this in verse number, 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that you, you, you stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. Stir up the gift of God. It means to rekindle, to stir it back to life. You wouldn't have to rekindle it and stir it back to life if it didn't wane. Rekindle it, stir it back to life, be enthusiastic, be fervent, be passionate, be vigorous. It means begin to get your fire back and do the things that you first did when you were on fire. Start doing that. Start speaking that way. Start acting that way. Don't you remember when you first fell in love with the Lord? Don't you remember when you first got excited and on fire for the things of God? You, you could not be stopped. And there was nobody that was going to escape your clutches. And every moment was an opportunity. So what ends up happening? Life gets in the way. Business gets in the way. Quote, unquote, ministry gets in the way. My goodness gracious. Thank you, Lord. It's almost like you need to get born again again. That, comes, that brings us right back to the opening scripture for this series, which is Romans 12, 11. No need to turn there. Romans 12, 11, I'll just tell you what it says. It says to be fervent in the spirit. The Amplified puts it this way, be aglow and burning with the spirit. The New Testament in American translation says be on fire with the spirit. Barclay says you must keep your enthusiasm at boiling point. And Moffat says you, you got to maintain the glow.
It's something that we do or it's something that we don't do. We're not waiting on God. Well, we're just waiting on God to light the fire. He did that in Acts chapter 2. He lit the fire at the beginning of the church. Fire hasn't gone out. The fire is here. The Holy Spirit is here. We are just as, this is a statement that's going to upset you, we are just as on fire or spiritual as we want to be. So you can't do this. It's their fault that I'm not on fire. You know, and when we say somebody's on fire for the things of God, really what we're saying is that they're more passionate and zealous than we are. They're more committed than we are. Oh, man, that dude's really on fire. Woo, he's on fire for God. I wish I could be that way. Well, whose fault is it that you're not? A lukewarm experience, listen, a lukewarm experience is on you. OMG. If I have a lukewarm Christian experience, it's on nobody but me. Because God's already given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. So what's he withholding? Well, nothing. If he's given me all things that pertain to life and godliness, then it's up to me to go get it. Go have it and maintain it. And if life gets in the way, if the ministry gets in the way, if the church gets in the way, if my marriage gets in the way, if my kids get in the way, if my grandkids get in the way, do something about it. Hebrews 12, 29, write this down. Hebrews 12, 29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. That fire is so strong and hot that it will consume everything that keeps you from his best in your life. If you will let it consume and burn out everything, it'll do just that. And it's a tragic lie that we believe, or some people have bought into this lie, that we get on fire early in our Christian experience. This is necessary to help us get started. And so we get on fire early on in our Christian experience, but then we have to settle into a more, I wrote down a more practical, sustainable commitment with balance. <laughs> Let me read that to you again. You can quote me on this. This is my quote. We get, this is a lie, we get on fire early on in our Christian experience, but we settle into a more practical, sustainable commitment with balance. That's a bunch of baloney with a capital B. Baloney. The church, the, Lord Je the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church should always be a place of awe and wonder. Every time we get together, man, it ought to be a shock and awe campaign. It always, it always needs to be a place of awe and wonder. The church is a body. It's the body of the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. It is a spiritual organism. The church has a spiritual assignment, and the church requires spiritual equipment. Period, end of discussion. So, with that in mind, let me start you off here. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, let, me just, let me just give you these references and then you don't need to turn there because we are going to go to Acts chapter 6. Um, but here, write this one, two, three, four, five. There's five scriptures I want you to write down. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. So don't turn, just go ahead and write that down and listen. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5, Paul said, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. A demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Okay, you write that one down? First, uh, now, 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. Now, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Isaiah 10, 27 says, The yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. That's a spiritual thing. It's the anointing of God that removes the burden and destroys the yoke. Paul said, 
I'm not going to do this thing with man's wisdom, but I, I am going to do it in a demonstration of the spirit and of power. And the yoke of bondage, the yoke of bondage, it keeps you moving in the direction of the flesh, or it keeps you moving in the direction of the devil, or it keeps you moving in an antichrist direction. That yoke that keeps you moving in that direction will be destroyed because of the anointing. It's spiritual equipment, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's the fire of God. Write this one down. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. The Son of God was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil are spiritual. The anointing is spiritual to break the works of the devil. And then in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, As he is, so are we in the next life. No, 1 John 4, 17 says, as he is, so are we in this world. We are anointed to remove the burdens and, destroys the, and to destroy the yokes. That's who we are. That's what we are. And then finally, Isaiah 12, 3. With joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. It's all spiritual. Joy is the serious business of heaven because it allows you to draw spiritual living water from the wells of salvation that are in you. You have wells, you have salvation on the inside of you. But the only way you're going to get up out of you and tap into it is through joy. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, it is a spiritual phenomenon is what it is. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy will manifest when you need it most. Did you ever wonder why sometimes you laugh at a crisis or tragedy or a disaster when everybody else is biting their fingernails and you're rolling on the floor laughing? It means you're drawing from the wells of salvation. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Trouble is, we're afraid of the manifestation of joy because, ooh, it might be of the devil. Hmm. Now let's temper this. Let's bring a little bit of balance, shall we? Because you're thinking, whew, I wish I could get on fire like that. Maybe if I got in that pulpit, I would. Oh, you think so. You think so. Acts chapter 6. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, make no mistake about it, I'm not turning the fire down. To the contrary, I'm turning the fire up. Hallelujah. Spiritual. While you're finding your way to Acts chapter 6, I will remind you that we are just as on fire and spiritual as we want to be. That the lukewarm experience is totally on us. But keep in mind, if you allow yourself the excuses... If you allow yourself to remain lukewarm, remember what Jesus said in the book of Revolution. Because you are neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you or spew you out of my mouth because you are lukewarm. <laughs> I don't want to have a lukewarm experience. I don't want to have a lukewarm commitment. I don't want to have a lukewarm passion. I want to be on fire, a consuming fire that I, it's like a fire shut up in my bones that if I don't do something, I'm going to literally be dead. Church should always be a place of awe and wonder, always. It always needs to be. The church is the body of Christ on the earth. It is a spiritual organism. The church has a spiritual assignment, spiritual assignment. And we require spiritual equipment. Now, in Acts chapter 6, I want to show you something that happened be at the beginning of the church. This is just one great story for you. Okay? <sighs> Take a deep breath. Relax. It's early. It's quarter to, ten, uh, quarter to 11. We've got at least five more minutes and then we'll let you go. No. No, when... We'll, we'll end when we're done. How's that? Chapter 6, the book of Acts, verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, 
there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. The church had a food program going. These widows, and especially in that time for that time period, in that culture, there was no way that they could go out and earn a living. N not legally and morally anyway. You know, um, These widows had really no way to take care of themselves. So the church had a little food program going. Now, I'm not saying that this was deliberate or intentional discrimination. I'm not saying that at all. But what if it were? What if it were? So what? The heart is desperately corrupt and wicked. Man is fallible. Man makes mistakes. This life that we're living is progressive anyway. Thank God we're not who we were. We're not, we're not who we're going to be, but we sure ain't who we were. Like Steve Storrs used to say, we, ain't, we haven't arrived, but at least we left. We haven't arrived yet, but at least we left. And so things happen progressively. You learn, you grow. But at this point in time, this is a problem. This is a problem because there was a murmuring. Like, this ain't right. You know what a murmuring is? This ain't right. What kind of a church is this? What kind of a leader? What kind of leadership do we have in this church? Uh, hold on. Let me just take a moment and pause. Let me say that again. What the heck kind of church is this? What kind of leadership do we have? Murmuring. You know, I don't know if I agree with all that. I don't know if I agree with the way they handled that situation. I don't know if I agree with the way that they're handling this situation. I don't think I like the way he dresses. I don't like the fact that, and you know what? It just goes on and on and on and on. And murmuring will quench the spirit in any church. So, as Andy Jackson would say, what's a mother to do? Next verse, two. Then the twelve, then the twelve. This is the twelve apostles. These are the original twelve. They called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and they said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now, you know the old saying, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Folks, that don't work in the church. I can't do everything as your pastor. And when I try to, it overwhelms me, it snuffs out the fire, and it gives me what we call agita. Uh, indigestion and heartburn. You got some agita? I got it all the time because I'm trying to do everything and be everywhere. Can't do it. It's not that reason, they said, that we should leave the Word of God. The primary objective is what? Ministering the Word of God. That's the priority of any church, the Word of God, not the Word of a man, not the Word of a political party or a platform or a social agenda, but to give this world the Word of God, whether or not they like it or receive it. It's not right that we leave the Word of God and serve tables. In other words, we're not serving tables because we have a job to do. What are you going to do about it? Verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, here are the requirements or the qualifications for what is known as the first deacons. That word deacon does not mean that you hold the political office in a church with power, with policy-making power. It means, basically, if you look this word up, you are a server. Th that's right. Look at verse 2, at the end of verse 2. It's not right that we leave the word of God and do what? Serve tables deacons serve it's a fancy word for serve but f get these guys get seven of them notice notice this ain't open for vote just find seven guys 
find seven dudes who have an honest report full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom that we may appoint over this business. Notice what's not mentioned in verse 3. No mention of their education level. No mention of the size of their bank account or the health of their portfolio with their investments. No mention of their social standing and their connections in the community either. He said, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Well, wisdom is the byproduct of having the Holy Ghost. How do you know if somebody's got the Holy Ghost, man? By their fire and their passion. And by the wisdom. Man, this dude's smart. How does he know this stuff about God and spiritual stuff? How does he understand all this? You'll know them by the fire. You'll know them by the passion. Their fire and their passion. Verse 4. But we, but we, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Well, I thought we're all supposed to pray. You are. But some of us have a little, a bit more of a special assignment for prayer and the word. And verse 5, the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. It says again, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost. Well, faith is a byproduct of the Holy Ghost. And then he, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, uh, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Guys, laid their hands on them to be deacons and serve tables? Wait, what? That's what they're being selected for. They're being selected to wait on tables and oversee the food distribution ministry. What do you mean lay hands on them? For what? Notice verse 7. And the word of God increased. Huh. Amazing what will happen if you do things the right way. Listen, religion's increasing. Philosophy is increasing. So is fear and confusion. And every other kind of platform and agenda, social platform, political agendas. These things are, these things are increasing as well. But if you want the Word of God, something that is very spiritual, to increase, then you've got to handle this thing spiritually because we are a spiritual organiz uh, uh, organism and we have spiritual equipment with spiritual strategies and we need spiritual men and women running even the most menial of tasks. Instead of looking for human talent or the size of someone's bank account or the reach of their social platforms, how about their... Get somebody who's full of the Holy Ghost, man. Get somebody who is on fire for the things of God. The word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith and, look at verse 8, Stephen, full of faith and power, griped and complained because he didn't get enough pulpit time because he's more than a deacon in his heart. No, as Stephen was faithful to do what he was asked to do, he did great wonders and miracles among the people. Huh, that's a deacon serving tables. Well, this is beneath me. You'll miss out. You will flat miss out if you have the attitude that this is beneath me because my call is ultimately something else. So you better step off that pulpit, boy, because I need some pulpit time to develop the gifts. Hold on. I don't see that in here. Verse 8 just says that Stephen's full of faith and power. He did great wonders and miracles among the sign. There arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of the, them of Cilicia and Asia, and they were disputing with Stephen. And they, verse 10, were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Huh. But then they 
they suburban men which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Liars! And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and called him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against his holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him. They saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. What happens when an ordinary server boy gets on fire for the things of God? Oh, you're going to stir things up. You're going to stir things up and you might, just might, get arrested for it. Somebody that gets arrested because they're zealous and passionate for the things of God, that's okay for them because, oh, we have to pray for, the, we have to pray for these people. Beloved, we need to pray for them. No, I'm not ever going to do that because I don't ever want to go through that. But we'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. It's good to see someone so on fire for God even though he's just a little server. How cute, bless his little heart. He thinks he's something. See, I knew, I knew he was a little bit too zealous because he ended up in custody. I knew there was something off about Stephen. I, see, I didn't want to say anything, but I knew something wasn't quite right there. You know, the Bible does say zeal without knowledge isn't good. Huh. Hmm. I don't know about you, but when it says my God is a consuming fire, when I get lit up on fire, I intend for him to consume and burn out everything in me, even if it's misunderstood and misrepresented and misaligned by the world and the religious leaders and the powers that be, even if it results in my ultimate demise. Because I don't answer to them. I answer to him. And I fear no man. I'm free from the opinions of man. I'm free from the prejudices of man. I'm free from their agendas and their programs. I'm free from it all to serve God, to do what he's called me to do, to be all that he's called me to be, to be on fire and to be the best me that I can be, regardless of where he puts me and regardless of what it costs me. Regardless of what it is going to cost me. It never mentions that Stephen had a degree. It never mentioned that he was a member in good standing with the synagogue. It doesn't mention any of these things. It just mentions time and again that this dude was lit up with the Holy Ghost. And the powers that be, the religious, social, and political powers that be were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake, so they shut him down and shut him up. Verse number 54, chapter 7. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, again, notice the scripture is going to refer to Stephen as being full of the Holy Ghost. Over and over. How would you like to be referred to in the scripture as Russ Hubbard, full of the Holy Ghost? Terry Fry, full of the Holy Ghost? Uncle C.C. C. Becker III, full of the Holy Ghost? Gary Baker, full of the Holy Ghost. Listen, I don't care what you introduce me as or what you know me as, but I want you to remember me as a man who was full of the Holy Ghost and on fire for the things of God. Listen, regardless of how I end up. Stephen ended up dead, stoned, by the religious who's who, by the political who's who. They were cut to the heart, but he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven. Watch this in verse 55. And he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they ran upon him with one accord. How dare you, you false prophet, you false teacher, lunatic, heretic. You can't look and see the glory of God and live. You can't see the things that you claim to have seen. Verse 58, they cast him out of the city 
and they stoned him. Hmm. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen. <sighs> now, we get the idea that when you throw stones, you pick up cute little pebbles. Throwing stones at Avery over there. And he said, ow, dude, that hurt. Stop. Ow, that stung. No, these aren't the type of stones we're talking about. These are the type of stones that when they hit you, they break bones. They crush your skull. They stoned Stephen. Stephen called upon God, said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and he cried in a very soft, tender, gentle, loving voice. He kneeled down and he cried with a loud voice, the fire of God at the end of your life. That's what I'm trying to communicate to you. Lord, Get these scoundrels, but good. No. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He went out in a blaze of glory. Now he just got what he deserved because I always thought he was off in church anyway. Always coming in and whistling and singing and and running around the sanctuary and screaming and shouting how he loves Jesus and oh, how he loves you and me. I knew he was a little fanatical. We kept telling the pastor to settle him down, temper him a little bit, but the pastor never would. I'd like to catch some of his fire, actually. I'd like some of that stuff to rub off on me. Verse 1 of chapter 8, Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Do you see what one fanatical nut started? Should have kicked him out of the church long ago. Put us in a negative light in the community. Opened us up to persecution. I know I'm talking to somebody. It may be somebody virtually, not in here necessarily. You see what that pastor opened us up to? Now we're under persecution. Uh huh. You, you hear the crickets, don't you? Because I do. That's good because people are either thinking or running. A per it, it doesn't even say a little persecution. It says a great persecution. And it resulted in that, the fact that they had to be scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles stayed there. But devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. But you know what Saul did in verse 3? He made havoc of the church. What I'm saying to you is that if you catch on fire for God and if you will be passionate and zealous and faithful right where you're at, what will it result in? Well, I'll tell you what it might result in. It might result in your ultimate demise. And it could result in persecution because, huh, you know, that church just doesn't know when to shut up and shut down. That church just doesn't know what's good for them and for the community. How could they be a church of love and not require A, B, and C? How could they be a church and how could, how could that pastor be a real man of God and not know what the rules are? What I'm telling you is this. Getting on fire and staying on fire, it's going to cost you everything because our God is a consuming fire. And until we're ready to let everything go, we won't see the move of God in the revival that we say we want. We won't see it. Not in my lifetime. Until we're ready to turn it loose and let it go. You know, you know one of the great tragedies, as I said to you before, is we bought into a lie that says it's okay to catch on fire and be an extreme zealot when you're first saved because the experience is new and you haven't been tempered and refined yet. But then as you grow and you settle down, you find a more sustainable experience, a more manageable way to do this because longevity, church, is the key after all. 
So let's temper things, let's balance it out. You don't want to burn it all up at once, do you? I do. I don't want to, I don't want to take anything home. I want to leave it all here at the altar and have it burned up. I want, to, I want to go out of here so drained and so depleted because I have been completely consumed. Let's start again tomorrow. Tomorrow's a brand new day to be just as passionate and, and as excited. That means any attitudes that I came in here with that are anti-Christ, I want them burned up and gone. That means any, any theology, personal theology or doctrine that I have held up to this point that is wrong, I want it burned up and gone, man. That means any, any kind of a, a lethargic spirit or a lackadaisical attitude or anything that, that might even be looked at as being lukewarm, I want it burned up in that fire. And here's the thing about being on fire. What if your zeal and your passion results in your ultimate demise? And I'm saying your ultimate demise because people who are unspiritual look and say, oh, what a shame. They had such a good future, but they gave it all away for their passion. What if you got thrown into the fiery furnace of, of persecution and public opinion? What if you were experiencing persecution because of your passion for God? What if you ended up in the fiery furnace? What of it? Because if you're on fire, nothing changes. You take a piece of wood that's already burning and blazing and on fire, and you put it in the fireplace with the other ones, what happens? Nothing. It's still being consumed. Peter had unparalleled, unparalleled opportunity experience, unparalleled. And in human history, nobody had the extensive training and intimate times with Jesus himself like the original 12 did. Specifically, Peter, James, and John. For three years, for three years, Peter traveled with the master. For three years, Peter received intimate instruction. For three years, he watched Jesus in action. For three years, he experienced things that pff, nobody else did, truthfully. Even Adam in the garden didn't. Because it said God would come down in the cool of the day. Jesus never left them. They stayed with Jesus wherever he was, right? But even that experience wasn't enough to make Peter the man of God that he needed to be. What? I think you heard me. Even that intense experience of three years with the master wasn't enough. Peter needed the fire of God. And what it turned Peter in to was something he'd never been before. Did he know Jesus? Of course he did. But how many of us, oh, I know Jesus, and we lack this power? How many of us can say, oh, I've got the life of God, but we have no equipping and no power for anything? There's a lot of Christians like that, so they have to figure out how to make up the deficit. How do I make the deficit up? Well, I, I apply my human talent. No, that'll never make up the deficit. Well, I can give more money. Well, I'd like you to give more money, but that'll not make up the deficit. Right? I mean, we can have better programs. We can have really good policies. And I'll tell you what, we'll even have our services measured out so that we know at what time he's doing what. Well, good luck with that one, too. You can't measure nothing with me. Except the unpredictability or the flexibility factor. It wasn't until the upper room experience, the fire got lit, and it caused Peter to become something he never was. In fact, in conclusion, the first spirit-filled, spirit-fueled sermon preached by Peter. In verse, chapter 2 of Acts, verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Acts 2.41 says 3,000 souls were added because of this first spirit-filled, spirit-fueled, spirit-anointed sermon. In verse 42, they continued steadfastly. They continued steadfastly doesn't mean once in a while, guys. They continued steadfastly doesn't mean 
bi-monthly or annually or quarterly, but steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. You want to keep your church strong and healthy? There it is. Let me say that to you again. They continued steadfastly in one, the apostles' doctrine, two, fellowship, three, breaking of bread, four, prayer. Well, no, our church needs programs. And our church needs, no, your church needs verse 42. And in verse 43, the result is the, that fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. There's no fear truly anymore for the things of God. There's no reverence. There's no fear. We're just careless. And it's almost shameful what we've done. Like God's my bud and my pard. He's my bud. I don't have the gall. I don't have the nerve to call him my bud. God ain't my bud, dude. Do that. <laughs> Hallelujah. So what are we going to do? Well, I'll tell you what I would do. I would start stirring up things that are in me. That's what I would do. That's what Paul said to Timothy. Start stirring this thing up. You don't have any more time to waste. That language is very emphatic. Quench not the spirit over there in 1 Thessalonians. Quench not the spirit. We don't have any more time to waste because the day of the Lord is coming and it will come like a thief in the night. It's going to happen. The end is going to come. And if not end for all of us, someone's end of life on planet Earth will be today. And if that doesn't do something to just shake you out of, out of a slumber or a sleep, if that doesn't cause you to wake up and say, wait a minute, somebody's going to leave planet Earth today and they're never going to have this life ever again? It's going to be forever over and they're going to go into the eternal realm? And they may not be ready? I can't afford for their sake to be anything less than fully on fire so that when they see me and when they hear me and they watch me, it changes them, it affects them, and they're never going to be the same because you cannot get around a man who's on fire and stay calm. It ought to be shock and awe. Every time they meet you, every time they talk to you, it ought to be shock and awe. It's like, man, I can't believe what rolls out of this dude's lips. Every time I see him, every time I talk to him, it just shakes me to the core. It causes me to be in wonder. It causes me to be awestruck. Because huh. I'm not just a good little church boy. I don't just attend church. I'm not just a, a reverend minister. Please don't insult me. And now his reverence, Pastor Gary, ill. When I walk in, I don't need no introduction. They see the man on fire when he walks in. If that's not your heart's cry, then you and God need to work some things out. You need to work some things out and say, Lord, I need some help because you intend for me to be ablaze. You intend for me to start this thing on fire and you intend for me to continue this thing on fire, and you intend for me to conclude this thing on fire so that I could say with a loud voice, Look, I see him! Oh, my goodness gracious! He's standing at the right hand of God! I see the glory of God! I double-dog dare you. And watch and see what the people do. Some of them are going to just come right to you, and, let the, and, and they'll allow themselves to be changed, Others are going to yell, crucify him. He's a nut. Can't have it both ways. It's one or the other. It can't be lukewarm. Listen, I want it neat and I want it cute and I want it courteous. I want to just have it, you know, a controlled experience because that, that's what a man of stature and fame is all about. Well, let's go ahead and stand up so we can conclude this thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.